anomaly detection for applications. And welcome, Ron. Hello. How are you? Welcome. Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me OK? Yes, sir. All right. We're ready to I'm start. Glad to have you. And um, as a, a fellow Texan, it's, it's great to, to end with your session. So welcome. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm ready to present. Uh, today, I'll be talking about developing Spidey Senses Anomaly Detection for Application. My name is Ron Dagdag. Uh, good morning, good evening. Here in Texas, it's good, good evening, but wherever you are in the world, maybe good afternoon to you. Uh, and welcome uh, to uh, Global AI Houston Edition. All right, well, before I start, I, I don't know if you saw my shirt. It's kind of related to what I'll be talking about today. We're talking about Spider-Man, of course, uh, and we'll talk about Spidey senses. And of course, we haven't if you haven't watched any of the Spider-Man series and all the reboots, uh, most probably it's time to watch. <laughs> There's a lot of movies out there related to Spider-Man. But what is a Spidey sense? Let me. Uh, it's that tingling sensation in the back of Peter Parker, Peter Parker's skull, uh, that tells him that to to sense that ability to to react to danger, to know that something's going on before it happens, right? It increases his ability to be able to detect evil, even his clones, navigate uh, him around when he is impaired or disoriented. Also helps him find secret passageways. And of course, it helps him change to his uh, costume or <laughs> to his, uh, to his uh, and also, and also helps him fire his web shooters and swing around the all these tall buildings and of course you know the real magic what i'm really uh, happy about is that real spider sense this real spider sense real spiders have this uh, hyper awareness that it's that long thin hairs that every time i look at it give, give me that uh, chills that trichobothria and what it is is that it can detect these low level vibrations through their uh, through their web and can detect uh, vibrations through the even just sound vibrations too and and also be able to um, detect small insects even three meters away so it's it's very interesting how they they can navigate without that real spider sense and of course you know sometimes you're a new web developer and if there are any new developers here uh, and that's how it feels like when you're trying to develop your website and you're just saying go uh, let's you deploy your application and nothing happens and that's so and that that's when you're still building up your spider sense right so what am i talking about here uh spidey sense it's 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 that gut feel or that feeling or what so we typically call intuition that helps us uh, discover some of the blind spots. It's at the end of the day, it's more uh, what we learned from the past that helps us determine you know, and and detect. You know, this is out of the ordinary, right? Um, so, if you look at it in terms of uh, in tech, you know. We have the high-level programming languages and compilers and low-level programming languages. The way for us humans, we have insights, interpreter modules, and of course, I'll be talking about this instincts and intuition. You know, if you think about insights, it's more of a high-level instincts and intu in intuition. What we call spidey sense is just uh, it's more of a low level that uh, our body just responds to to it, just as a uh, you know, a, an expert knows or like a baseball player knows when to shoot or when, when to hit the ball, those kind of things. It becomes part of their instinct and intuition. So today I'll be talking about uh, anomaly detection. And the way I kind of look at what is anomaly detection, 
it kind of relates to the spidey senses, right? It's 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 detecting that's weird, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, we'll talk about time series anomaly detection. We'll do some demos and some takeaways. So anomaly detection, uh, it's the identifying unexpected items or events in our data set, which is different from what is normal. You know, these days we attend conferences over the virtually. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I know I miss talking to other folks and being uh, being able to 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 have conversations and be able to to do presentations in real life, but here we are, we're in an outlier year, right? So, what are the assumptions of anomaly detection? Uh, the anomalies rarely occur in the data; it doesn't happen all the time, and the features differ from normal instances significantly, and you'll see patterns around that. So what are the main you know, two causes of an outlier? You know, it could be an artificial or non-natural, and of course, sometimes natural. Some examples would be maybe data entry errors and what we typically call fat finger, right? Uh, so the difference between 100,000 versus 1 million is one extra zero. And that, that can cause something uh, that, that's of an outlier. Uh, measurement error, uh, which is very common, and how you uh, you measure it in meters or in versus you know being able to uh, measuring in in different units that can that can cause an outliers. Experimental errors where you start collecting your data late in the sprint instead of uh, you know gradual or the, the whole the whole period intentional errors it could be one good example is under reporting alcohol consumption uh, for uh, teenage kids that can be intentional outlier uh, data processing error is when we transfer data from one uh, data set to the other and how we extract those data can cause uh, an outlier sampling errors uh, this one relates to report, reporting heights for all athletes, an example of it. And, you know, your, and then most of your uh, data set is basketball players, so that would skew it. And of course, natural outlier when it's not artificial, that it's not man-made. So what we're trying to do here is we're, you know, we have our data stream, we have our data set, and we're trying to identify, is, it, uh, is that data anomalous or not? And of course, there are instances where you know, you're able to de define the defective ones. The blank ones means it's not defective or non-defective. So sometimes you'll, it, it's, you know, you, you'll, you'll be able, most hopefully your, your algorithm will be able to find mostly defective ones, but sometimes it can pass uh, that you would, that even the non-defective you would uh, detect as anomalous. And of course, you know, typically, or, what can happen is you are not able to detect the, the defective ones out of your data set. But at the end of the day, it's uh, anomaly detection is kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. If the needle is that big, it's, it's easy. And sometimes it's not, right? And most of the time it's not. Uh, methods for doing anomaly detection, it could be rule-based, you can be using statistical techniques and machine learning. I'll go through each one of those. Rule-based system, you know, most likely you've worked this if you're a developer, you have a specific rules that you identify. Let's say if the temperature of the room is certain degrees, then that means uh, you, know, you specify that, hey, you know, you know, my fridge was, was out and if the certain temperature drops on a certain, certain level, then, then it could be a problem. So that's when you assign thresholds and limits to identify uh, what is anomaly. Uh, the advantage or the disadvantage of a rule-based system is that you need experts to detect the known anomalies. You need experience of industry experts. And the downside is it does not adapt to pa as patterns change, right? If your data set have changed and your rules uh, is, is set to, to something rigid, then you may not be able to detect 
the, uh, the, the anomalous data. And it does require some data labeling, which can be tedious. A statistical techniques, uh, typically that's when you do some calculations from your data points. The most common ones is mean, median, or quantiles. Uh, could be a rolling average, a moving average to, to be able to detect uh, anomalies. It could be, you know, a low pass filter. Uh, the good thing about statistical techniques is it's easy to interpret, it's easy to calculate, and sometimes it's easier to explain to to uh, the business person to, to know what's going on compared to a machine learning model. Of course, machine learning model, it could be to detect anomaly, it could be supervised, unsupervised, or self-supervised. So I found out looking at all these different techniques. There's a lot of ways how you can do anomaly detection. There's a lot of different techniques. Uh, so to compare, when should you use anomaly detection algorithms uh, versus uh, supervised learning? Uh, to compare each one, so anomaly detection is when you have a very small number of positive example as compared to uh, the supervised learning is when you have kind of have about the same amount of positive and negative examples. On the, um, uh, of course, there's different types of anomalies. So sometimes it's harder to learn. So it's better to for us to be able to do um, when you, you when you have a small number of positive examples. It's it's better to to use anomaly detection techniques. And sometimes you have not discovered uh, future anomalies yet. For supervised learning, if you have kind of like a similar, similar data set as what you're uh, you're testing it with your or you're inferencing it with. So what use case where you do anomaly detection when you have fraud detection or manufacturing, or if you have machines, or if we're talking about Internet of Things, uh, that would be a good use case. Uh, monitoring uh, data centers uh, for supervised learning, you know, Email spam classification is a good use for it. There's a lot of examples already of a spam, so it's better to to use a uh, supervised learning technique. Uh, weather prediction is uh, there's certain uh, you know types of weather that you're you're detecting as compared to uh, to some anomaly detection data set. Uh, anomaly detection is when usually you have patterns, right? Uh, cancer classification would make sense as supervised learning if you have an expert uh, already classified for you and uh, have the data set available. All right. So machine learning, to, in order to do anomaly detection, sometimes it could be density-based. So that's when we talk about K nearest neighbor, uh, where it's, it's around the data, right? Uh, clustering, it could be... Uh, Clustering-based, it could be, that's when we talk about k-means, uh, where it's uh, similar uh, similar tend to belong to, to certain clusters. It could also be Gaussian, how you would detect uh, anomalies. So where if, if, if it's outside of the distribution, most likely that's a, that is an anomaly. Uh, support vector machines, also, where you split your, uh, your data set into half. Uh, where uh, you're, you're identifying the high density points versus negative for small densi densities. Uh, PCA-based anomaly detection also can be used. I'm not going to focus on each one of the algorithms. Uh, I want to focus on uh, how we would use it for time series data. Uh, time series data is when you have a series of data points indexed in time order. One good example is which, you know, if you tune in to CNBC, you see it every day, the stock market data. It, it is a good example of, uh, of time series. If you work for a company, most likely there's sales data that they they show every year and that's and, and we show every quarter, right? That is your sales data. That's a good example of a time series. Uh, sensor data, you know, if you think about uh, any sensor data, it's captured a specific point in time, you know, at certain room, that would be 
at the end of the day, it's anything that's captured with a, with a timestamp. And of course, if we talk about Internet of Things, which, which is I'm interested about, is more, you know, because the data, the sensors are becoming cheap. We get cheap. We get more data that's fed to our machines. Right? We can collect more data. And of course, networking has improved so we can transfer more data to our servers or be able to process more data because of, of because of networking. But if you think about Internet of Things per se, how critical it's becoming critical, you know, at homes, even even sometimes I get frustrated when I can't turn off the TV using uh, Google Home or, you know, Madame A, uh, you know, the Alexa stuff. So it's the, the, the risk environments are moving very fast, but, you know, failures are not tolerated. So it's more and more things that we need to do observability on these machines, right? And this is what it feels like when you have an internet of broken things. You have data passing through, you have data streams passing through you and trying to figure out where the where the problem is happening. It, it makes sense to have at least some monitoring or some way to be able to uh, have the machine tell us what's going on, what's different or what's, what is anomalous <laughs> or, or what is weird about it, right? So um, today, of course, more and more, there's a need for artificial intelligence of things. So where we, we talked about intuition, right? You have your instincts and intuition, and then it goes up uh, to the interpreter module, and you have your insights, which when you, when you think about in the Internet of Things, or artificial in, intelligence of things. Uh, so we have your edge gateway or your real-time devices collecting some data, at the edge, you do some processing over there, and then you send up some data up to the cloud. That's when we talked about uh, in our previous session about device twins. Uh, and then, of course, you know, as as we explain what's happening in the cloud, as we explain what's happening to our sensors, we build this business intelligence or dashboard to be able to to show uh, you know, some some of the reports or some of the, some of the things that need that is needed to be able to uh, have our business intelligence. So time series anomalies, uh, it could be uh, different, there can have different types. It could be an outlier, spike and level shift, pattern change or seasonality. So you have to consider all that. Outlier would look something like this, right? You have your time series data and you know, you're collecting some data you know, at this range and suddenly, poop, it went up there. It's like, what happened there, right? So that's an outlier. Another one is the spike and level shift. So most likely, you know, you think about the hose or your, your pipe or water coming out uh, from, from, from the city to your home and suddenly uh, there was a leak and there's that spike or, or level shift. And, depending on how much pressure you're receiving. So that might be a good example of it to consider. Uh, pattern changes. Yeah, this is another example where you know, you're gardening <laughs> and you know, your water is, is this much. And then suddenly someone stepped on that hose and, <laughs> and now you have less water coming out. So that's, that might be a good example of a pattern change. Uh, something's different. And now you have to consider you know, that is weird, that is different. Do you need to be notified about that? And of course, seasonality, you know, you, know, you think one, one of the smallest, you know, item, if you think about a machine itself, it has its patterns going back and forth, right? You know, if you think, if you think about it, manufacturing uh, is, you know, you have a machine that goes back and forth or do, do its, its thing, and processing some some widget or creating some widget and suddenly uh, it stopped or some some issue is going on that could be or you think about ice cream sales uh, also seasonality that's related to that if you think about longer terms right uh, ice cream sales is higher during summer as compared to uh, you know the winter time so that that might have an effect in your sales data so that could be considered as uh, as 
figuring out what seasonality. So when you're when you're doing anomaly detection, you have to consider that too. Uh, we did talk about production issues, and it feels like whenever there's problems with your streaming data or your data set, uh, it's like stopping a, a train. All right, so to explain a little bit more, some this is just to kind of give uh, an example right here. This is a machine, uh, and it goes back and forth, stops after a few seconds runs stops and what this one is doing uh, is it's feeding this data and as it receives the data it's detecting here that is anomalous or there's an anomaly there we were expecting the value was 35.43 we expected the value to be 48 so do we uh, get alerted or not and so you see these blue items that kind of identifies like your ranges and how you would you know, kind of expected that value. Notice how this one was not detected uh, on, on this case because you, know, you can you can tune in sensitivity and how you would you would want to to kind of get alerted on which one uh, of, of these anomalies are. So that that might be a good use case of how you would use this uh, anomaly detection. So this application, if you want to try it, there's a on GitHub. It's called Intelligent Kiosk, and uh, it's part of the Cognitive Services samples. Time series anomaly detection. Uh, we'll when we we'll talk about that, you know, talk about spikes and change points. Spikes would be the temporary burst, uh, anomalous behavior in your system. Change points would be those level changes and trends. Uh, today we'll focus on what is in in um, what is anomaly detection in IoT, and you know we'll talk about ML.NET in in our edge devices running that, and then we'll talk a little bit more about Azure Stream Analytics and how we would do anomaly detection in Stream Analytics, and also talk about something related to uh, anomaly detector, which is part of uh, Azure Cognitive Services. Okay, ML.NET, it's built for .NET developers, if you're developing C-sharp or F-sharp, uh, use your existing skills, and uh, there is, M, you know, having M, it does not require you to have machine learning experience to be able to incorporate uh, machine learning to your device, uh, to, to, to your .NET application. ML.NET has a time series catalog that you can use to be able to do anomaly detection. So there's few uh, few items on the library to be able to detect. I'm not going to talk through each one of these, but to know if you need to research a little bit more, uh, they have different algorithms that that they're using, and it's it's documented there. Uh, today we'll be talking about this. I believe this detect IID spike. Um, which talks about this IID algorithm. So uh, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more. Okay, so ML.NET, we'll do some demos related to this. Okay. So ML.NET, if you want to use it, I have this program. Uh, let's look at first the CS, CS proj in order to use um, in order to use uh, ML Microsoft uh, ml.net you have to include microsoft.ml and microsoft.ml.time series and these are the two nuget packages you have to to include in your in your application so on, on this one, this sample that I have, I have this test data. Uh, it's a comma-separated file. I, you know, it's a time series data. This is the time it was captured, and on this case, I'm capturing temperature and humidity uh, for for this data. Okay. 
and then my program.cs so in order to use ml.net you have two things you have to to add microsoft.ml and in this case microsoft.ml.data and what i'm doing here is i want to be able to read that csv file and uh, to read that csv file i have here uh, this ml context uh, where i can i can load from the text file with this initial humidity data so let's go back here so i want to to where is this one at so I have I need three columns from that CSV files, right? In this case, I want to specify in column two that temperature, humidity, and of course the time. So those are the columns that I that is mapped on my CSV file that I want to map to this class. And notice that they're all string, so I have to convert it to something that ML.NET would be able to use. Okay. And so what I'm what I'm doing here is I want to to add two new columns for my data set. Okay, uh, so let's go back to this class program, and what this one is doing is um, we have to initiate that ML context, and this ML context that allows you to be able to access the the ML libraries. So ML context that data that load from text file. This is how you would load the text file. Uh, it's specifying, hey, I, I have a comma separated value. I have quotes on my data set. Yeah, I have a header. And where is my, my, my where is my uh, file? So in certain directory. And then I have to pass it to this pipeline. And what this pipeline is doing is I'm converting it from string, right, for that, that column I converted the string into single. So that means it becomes a number that I can use. And then I, there's always that two patterns whenever you call, it's always fit and transform. Uh, fit allows you to create that transformer and then transform would, would change that data. And and that would give me the the, the data set as as a float or as as a single, and then I can pass this to this um, item right here, this uh, to this method, and we can identify now to create and call that um, and call this uh, library. Right, it's called this uh, anomaly detector, uh, anomaly detection uh, library over here. So ML dot ML context that transform that detect IID spike. You specify your input column. In this case, I'm doing uh, the temperature. Right, be able to detect uh, if there's anomaly on that uh, the temp temperature data. And I, I have to specify two things. I have to specify how far does it look every time I run this estimator, right? Uh, in this case, I look at the last 25 items on my data set, and I want it to have uh, to tweak it uh, to where you specify the confidence. So that means um, it's it's the tune in the sensitivity. So that means it's more sensitive to to anomalies. So once you have that, you have to pass in, you know, that that pattern fit and transform. Uh, you specify and you have to create this empty data set. The good thing about this, uh, uh, these um, anomaly detection is that it does not need any uh, anything. It does not need any more data than what, what you're passing in. That means it does not need training data. It, it creates the algorithm for you as it goes, as, as it pass in. That's why you're passing in an empty data data view, and uh, you pass in your 
your, your data set. And once you have that, then you can do your predictions. And on this prediction, um, it would it would tell you uh, which one was uh, anomalous or not when uh, it's it's equal to one. Where one of the columns, the first column on it, is equal to one. So let's see if I can run this application. Sometimes it makes sense once once we run it. Okay. So you see how it read my uh, data set. All right, my, my CSV file, it, this is one of the columns uh, from that data set, which is the temperature columns. And then this one right here is the, you know, kind of like the output or the, the, the value. The T, is, they call it the, the P value, the probability that it's anom anomalous. So as it goes, goes here, at the bottom of my uh, CSV file, you know, since it's temperature right here, Notice how my data set is a little, you know, it's, there are some changes on my data set uh, that it went up uh, 100 degrees and this one's a thousand. Uh, so if you scroll down right here at the bottom, it was able to detect, hey, that, that one right there, this item 124, that's out of the ordinary. So there is that spike as it goes through each one and it, it was able to detect there were spikes from on your data set. Cool. So that's how you can you can use uh, ml.net. There, there's a time series catalog, and this time series catalog you can call some of these algorithms to do uh, this the IID detection or this anomaly detection. Okay. Let's go back to the presentation. Another way is through Azure Stream Analytics. Uh, so let's say you're sending your data from that IoT device or from, you know, from a log file or some of the weather data or some of your business apps. Maybe you store it through blob storage or you pass it through Event Hub or IoT Hub and as you ingest it. You can actually export that or pipe it to Stream Analytics and then on stream analytics, you can have this real-time scoring to be able to do anomaly detection as it reads through each one of your time series data. And of course, once it detected, hey, there's an anomaly, you can specify an alert and say, hey, uh, there's something wrong. Something's going on. You can also pass it to uh, your data warehousing or however you need to uh, store that or transform your data. So in um, stream analytics, this is how you would you would incorporate uh, anomaly detection. There is a uh, anomaly detection underscore spike and dip. Actually, this one uses uh, anomaly detector uh, cognitive services at the back end already. But what it's doing here is as you receive the data, you look at the last, in this case, the last 120 seconds of the data that you receive, uh, and you specify, you know, like your sensitivity. And of course, in this case, you know, since my data is coming in as per second, 120 uh, items, and then it would detect anomaly on this one based from that uh, as, a, as an extra step. And then from that extra step, you would look at your data set and, and it would have this is anomaly and then of course the score. And then from that, it would identify and, and show you the, uh, if, there, if there are errors or if there's anomalies. Another one is kind of like the same way. Uh, change point, which is uh, anomaly detection, underscore change point, you specify, okay, in this case, uh, you know, the last 20 minutes of my data, uh, one of the parameters here is, um, you know, you tune in, you specify the sensitivity, and then how many items you have to look back. And and based from that, you, you, it, will, it will create that uh, 
anomaly detection step and you can identify if it's anomaly uh, or not and then of course the score so i'm not gonna demo these because it takes kind of while to to kind of collect the data send it out to iot hub and then stream analytics and and do this real-time scoring but i'm going to focus on uh, the cognitive services side also uh, to to have another uh, demo but sure there you know what my goal here is to show you that hey you can also do it through um, stream analytics without creating a, your your a different service it's already part of the uh, of the library or, or of that uh, new SQL I believe so cognitive services how you can use it you know it's just an uh, it's for AI for every developer uh, and you know cognitive services have decision language speech apis vision apis and web search apis uh, today we'll talk about the decision part which is one of them is anomaly detector uh, so which is uh, identifying potential problems early on uh, they also have personalizer and content moderator so anomaly detector has different features uh, to where you can do it also uh, as a batch and also as real time so real time meaning uh, you send the data and it would detect the last item on your list if that one is anomalies uh, if there that one has an anomaly or not uh, as a batch if you want to create you know say let's say you're building a report your sales data you pass all your your time series sales data and it would re that api would return uh you know where the anomalies are the good thing about the anomaly detector it automatically adapts and learns from new data and of course you can also tune uh, the sensitivity of it but then it's just a rest api it doesn't you know, as for us developers app developers you know we don't need machine learning ex expertise uh, to incorporate it to our program uh, it doesn't it eliminates us the need for uh, training data because it does not require any any training data uh, it identifies the best fitting model and at the end of the day what's happening behind it is it actually uh, detecting uh, features and then classifies what type of uh, time series it is and which algorithm would best fit for that that data set and then if, if it has seasonality it already considers seasonality uh, if it does not have seasonality uh, sometimes it does find granularity and some of these algorithms i'm not sure how to explain each one of them but you know for us app developers it's just easy enough for us to use and incorporate to our application so some of the limitations uh, you have to specify uh, data granularity you know it's either going to be daily hourly minutely monthly weekly yearly data and of course if you have missing pieces like for example uh you know you miss there's missing data in terms of like you know you, you said let's say your data set is daily and there are a few things that are missing you can you know what makes sense there is specify uh or or kind of patch it in or patch some data right uh and also you have the minimum data you can send to the api you have to have at least uh 12 items or 12 uh on that on that series uh, up to 8640 entries so in this case this is you now like you know, when you call the api you have to pass in this json file you specify the granularity and then this your time series data specify the timestamp and then the value of each one uh, on on here if you if your data set is every five minutes there's a way you can specify a custom interval uh in this case uh, every five minutes and then your data set could be five minutes every five minutes here all right uh there's multiple ways in how you would call uh anomaly detector you can use client sdk or rest api uh the good thing about the client sdk you can use c you know, there's one for c sharp Python and Node, uh, uh, you know, for REST API, the good thing is, you know, you, 
as long as you know any language that supports HTTP calls. So let's do a little bit of demo on this. Okay, uh, let's go back to my presentation here. So I have this machine right here, which is my Raspberry Pi. Let's see if it shows up. Okay, where's my Okay, let's have my camera here. Let me restart that camera. It look like it's. Let me wake up that camera real quick. There you go. There's my Raspberry Pi right here. And this Raspberry Pi, uh, I did install um, Jupyter Notebook. And on that Jupyter Notebook, I'm using TS Lab. Uh, which is uh, allows me to be able to create a, you know this Python notebook that runs TypeScript in the back end. Uh, on this TypeScript, on this package JSON, we're going to use this dependency, right? It's called AI Anomaly Detector, and uh, this MS REST JS. And also, I'm I'm connecting to the sensor on my Raspberry Pi here. Uh, which has this what we call sense hat on top of the Raspberry Pi that we and I'm using this node dash sense hat to be able to read temperature data or read sensor data from my uh, from that device. So those are some of my dependencies on this program. So uh, so first you know, console app. So how you would run this uh, in Python notebook, you say console.log, specify hello, I'm using TS lab here to, you know, to make to verify uh, there's my TypeScript version, the node version that is installed on this Raspberry Pi. Uh, notice that I'm connected to my Raspberry Pi uh, using um, this Python notebook. And and of course, this one right here, where you specify the uh, uh, sense hat, there's the, on here we specify the LEDs. I want to read the LED and, uh, and be able to clear. And to get some accelerator data, I specify here acceleration, the gyroscope, and here's my acceleration data that I got. And then we have some values to get some of these values right here to get my temperature, humidity, and all that. And this is to add. So what I'm doing here is I want to collect this data set, right? So I want to get my timestamp you know, from this Raspberry Pi, be able to get those values. And once I run those values, I can call the API, and I'm using this library uh, called Anomaly Detector. And of course, in order to call that Anomaly Detector, you have to specify and create the, uh, the instance in Azure. Uh, so this is some of the command lines I did run in order to call the Anomaly Detector in Azure and then be able to, uh, to get the key, right? Because you need the API key and the endpoint in order to do this. And then based from that, uh, be able to call this anomaly detector with that endpoint and that credential, right? That key, and that would give me the anomaly detector client, and that anomaly detector client would uh, then I can call the API, pass in this time series data, right? And I need to pass in what kind of data set it is, right? The granularity. I have my data set is every minute, and then I call this API to detect if the last item on my list is anomalous or not. If not, you know, and then in this case, after I run it, it didn't detect that is is not anomalous. So because everything is ordinary. So in, on this next one, what I did was to say, OK, give me the last item and let's push it as, you know, like a Give me the last item and add 100 to it, and let's pass that in. Uh, so the last item would be a 140. So on this one, 
I want to specify on my Raspberry Pi on my uh, Pi and and some of these pixels over here. So what I want to do is to kind of navigate those pixels and then call this last detection, pass that in, and if the if it's anomalous, it would put a cross here. So let's see what happens. Let's try to run this real quick. So pass that in. There you go. See that big X right there? So that means my, the, the data set that I did send, the last item on my list was anomalous and it put a big X right there. And of course, that is too bright. I want to turn that off and I can control it from here. So what happened here is it calls the API and then gave me the result from that data set if the last item is anomalous or not. Cool. So let's go back to the presentation. All right, so where can you use this? It could be C Sharp, JavaScript, you, will read, you can actually have it inside Docker containers. You can incorporate it to Power BI and Databricks. Uh, I'm not going to talk more about this metrics advisor because we don't have a lot of time, but that's also something that you might want to look into if you know that it's also part of Azure Cognitive Services. And what it is is a place where you can collect and add a time series data be able to detect anomalies. Uh, it, so it kind of creates a portal for you to be able to detect these anomalies. It creates those graphs and send those incidents and alerts. You can specify where those alerts go. And also based from that alert, points you to uh, be able to detect uh, root causes and, and identify root causes. So at the end of the day, the best superpower that you can give to your uh, to your application is a Spidey Sense, and uh, if you're interested in uh, getting, uh, I'm gonna post this on the chat, or you can you get the QR code uh, to get the information about my presentation and also the the the, the samples that I discussed today. If you want to to look into that. And who am I? If you want to learn more about me, my name is Ron Dagdag. I'm a lead software engineer. I'm a fourth year uh, Microsoft MVP. Uh, this is the best place to contact me is through LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. And I appreciate you spending time with me and geeking out about Spidey senses, anomaly detection, uh, talking about ML.net, talking about uh, Raspberry Pi. And now that uh, you got bitten off by this spider, feel free to experiment about anomaly detection. Cool. Thank you very much. Salamat po. That's uh, thank you in Tagalog in Filipino. Thanks, Ron. Um, Any questions? That was great. <laughs> um, so I, I did have a question. We've had uh, data cleanliness come up quite a few times in the sessions today. So, yes. in your opinion, like what percentage of a product project um, actually involves the data cleaning versus the the data programming? So, well, it it is a lot, right? In terms of a lot of it is more how do you collect the data better so that you can pass it to these APIs or you can pass it to your your machine learning models to be able to to have better results, right? Bad data means bad, bad results. So, so data cleaning is important and it's it's critical. And a lot of it is more, you know, you got to think in terms of anomaly detection, right? How do I collect this data? What if my sensor fails, and how do I, how do I plug? So in that case, let's say the the sensor failed for like five minutes, uh, or you weren't able to collect the data. So now you have to decide in data cleaning. Do you do you kind of you know if it's every minute you, do you do you kind of say okay look at the average for the last few minutes and then just plug in for the ones that are missing or then plug in your, those missing data so a lot of those you have to consider especially if you're doing uh, any time series uh, processing data processing yeah so we just heard from Fergus and Rayfield talk about IoT and manufacturing and healthcare scenarios. So what are you seeing um, 
kind of customers in the field and programmers in the field doing um, to, to create that active live syncing of data so that they can build bolder, bigger and more um, verbose machine learning models. So what I'm kind of seeing, because my background, where I'm, where I'm at, where I work at, we're on the retail side, right? So, in, mm -hmm. so if you think about in the retail area, you have, you know, once you start collecting some of the, the data of, of the shelves and information about, uh, you know, your, your inventory and all that inventory management, the more and more need to have these, uh, you know, anomaly detection uh, algorithms. Uh, so I, I came from manufacturing background. So if, if you think about, uh, you know, I used to work for an elevator company and more and more identifying b problems before it breaks, right? Identifying, uh, you know, anomalies from your machine and creating that, that uh, feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. to, to the technician and say, okay, before it breaks or before things happen, there's something going on with that machine. So when, when you do anomaly detection on that machine, alert someone. And so they can send, uh, you know, a notification, not just notification, but also send a technician before it, before the eleva elevator uh, stops. So it, it would, it would improve uh, uptime or, or, or also at the same time, you know, reduce, reduce risk or reduce being stuck in an elevator <laughs> and those mm -hmm. kind of issues. So, so it's more and more need for, uh, for a lot of these observability. And once you start talking about observability in our data or observability in our, not, not just our machines or not just, you know, our, on the edge or not just our data centers, the observability, you, yes, it's good to collect all these data, but more and more need for, those alerts more and more need for these anomaly detection you know, to to identify what is different what is weird and 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 process that and so it you, it's day. interesting because you just said process right so it sounds like there is a technical process using the technology and then there's a business process and maybe even like a operational manufacturing yes. yeah process. So different types of processes as it flows so, through so if i'm a data engineer and or I I am um, in the analytics department, and you know I am I'm building the machine learning models. Then how do I kind of get these other stakeholders involved into this dis discussion? And and who are you seeing championing these predictive maintenance projects um, where we're we're trying to shorten the time of delivery or uh, extend the time of life on a product? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing more and more uh, in terms of the operation side, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, where where this anomaly detection would be, you know, like if, if you're going to implement some machine learning to your company or some AI to your company, the easiest way you can do it now, everyone have sales data, everyone have mm -hmm. inventory data. Having these anomaly detection algorithms is, is one of the first steps. That I think you know, monitoring your devices, even monitoring uh, the different machines, SQL servers, or you know, all these different machines you have uh, in the cloud or even on-prem, and be able to do anomaly detection in each one. It, it's it's the it seems like uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to to talk more about these Spidey senses devices, right? It's 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 it's, it's 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 a one way for us to you know not just app developers but also uh, operations right if you can add anomaly detection to your uh, to your to your log ob your observability they said that right there is it's a big win already and of course if you're a data engineer and how you would uh, you would pitch this in and or you how you would you would collect this in is more okay well let's start with you know, let's start with cognitive services one, or let's talk, start with metrics advisor. Right. You, you know, that, I'm a fan of cognitive services. And, yes. and, and so I, you threw that out there. And uh, yeah, so that's, 
that's a great way to get started fairly quickly with experimenting yes. on your data is yes. cognitive services. So thank yes. you. And then of course, as you, as there's a need for more detailed and more customized, uh, you know, anomaly detect detection algorithms, then it makes sense to have uh, a specialist be part of your team. But you know, let's incorporating it, and and I'm surprised, you know, based from my presentation, it can get complex, and there's different algorithms how you could implement this, and a lot of these cognitive, a lot of these tools that's coming up is actually making it easier for us app developers to have AI or machine learning into our applications and into our yeah. into our uh, data, you know, it's more and more to, into our uh, data set. <laughs> anyway. So I definitely want to say thank you for joining us tonight. And I, I, I enjoy the animation. So it's, you know, a lot of speakers put a lot of time and effort into their presentations and their demos. And you definitely kept everyone at the edge of their seats and entertained. And I, I'm more of a Batman fan. But <laughs> I, I think I could be more of a Spider-Man fan now. So <laughs> yeah. thank you. And um, if you did have a chance to drop a note with uh, your source code repo information in GitHub, then I, I know I have a ton of people who are interested in uh, running through some of those code examples. So we're definitely looking forward to it. And thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad to be able to talk about Spidey Senses. <laughs> cool. Have a good night. You too. Have a good night. So thank you, everyone, for making it through Global AI on Tour Houston edition with us. Uh, it's been a great set of sessions, and it it seems like some of the themes that were coming up were definitely um, being open to learning new things and uh, collaborating with people in the industry, which is great for me because as a member of Global AI community, that's, that's really what excites us is working with the different people uh, who are getting excited about AI technologies. So uh, another thing theme that came up seemed to also be data cleanliness. So um, remember, even as technology expands and we have new use cases, it's really you know only going to be dependent on how good your data set is. So it, it's kind of interesting that those themes came up as well. Uh, keep an eye on our Global AI community site uh, for the replays. And we'll also be posting contact information for all of the speakers. And I do have a quick reminder about our giveaways. So thank you to Arinti for sponsoring our giveaway. You can go ahead and follow them at Arinti underscore VE. Or you can go ahead and enter in for the $50 giveaway by replying via tweet hashtag live from Houston. Um, our other sponsor was Microsoft. So thank you, thank you for consistently sponsoring Global AI community events. You can visit tour.globalai.live, win prizes for the Microsoft swag box. And you can also claim your Azure Heroes Learning badge as a participant for today's activities. I did want to share that from one of our previous events. I'm dying for us to get back in a room together and uh, do the networking that these events are, are really all about in addition to the learning. So um, hopefully I'll see you sooner rather than later. And with that, we're, we'll be signing off and we'll see you at Global AI on Tour Sydney, which is our next stop. Thank you and have a good night.